Now I would guess you have all heard Charles Darwin's chart-topping blockbuster, Origin. And I would hope you have also heard the B-side, Descent. You may not be aware that Darwin wrote on a wide range of topics, one of which was the structure and distribution of coral reefs, which he alluded to in Origin. Darwin had never seen a ring atoll when he came up with his theory concerning the evolution of coral reefs, but he was well read on the subject. In particular, he had read Charles Lyell's 1832 Principles of Geology, which detailed the knowledge of the day and the widely accepted view that coral ring atolls grew from submerged volcanic craters. Lyell was writing after reading, amongst others, Otto von Kotzebue and Captain Beechey's reports of their separate three-year voyages through the Pacific as part of the then-continued search for the Northwest Passage. Both Kotzebue and Beechey had described several Pacific atolls in detail, and their observations, added to previous explorers' notes, confirmed in Lyell's mind that ring atolls were the result of coral populating the cones of dormant submerged volcanoes. Now, Darwin's voyage around South America had given him ample time to view the effects of the historic intermittent elevation of land and its effect on the deposition and removal of sediment. He then imagined substance in place of elevation and he had a hypothesis for the creation of ring atolls and barrier reefs. When he later observed the coral ring atolls firsthand, he was able to confirm, in his mind, that his hypothesis was correct. On returning from his trip on the Beagle, Darwin communicated his hypothesis to Lyle, who immediately contacted William Werwell, head of the Geological Society. And on May 31st, 1837, Darwin read a paper entitled On Certain Areas of Elevation and Subsidence in the Pacific and Indian Oceans as Deduced from the Study of Coral Formations. The whole idea might seem obvious to us now, but only because of the genius and inquiring minds of the many Lyles and Darwins which preceded us. But all of this causes a big problem for creationists. The volcanic island upon which the Eniwetak Atoll formed is now nearly a mile under the Pacific, and you need a lot of time for slow-growing coral and gradual subsidence of the volcano to raise the coral reef almost a mile. Now, Ken Ham's very profitable family business extends to employing non-Ham family members as well, but it is Ken's show. He is the organ grinder, and his monkeys, in this case, are Andrew Snelling and John Whitmore. As I continue to educate myself on the many wonders of the natural world, I am often drawn to answers in Genesis to see how Ken Ham and his Bibaloons attempt to explain away the scientific realities which dismantle their Middle Eastern myths. And so recently, when I was reading about coral reefs and atolls, I popped over to Bible land to see what children were being taught to believe. The first OIG paper I came across was from Creation Magazine 1991. Discussing any Wetak atoll, AIG states... Drilling revealed about 1,400 metres of reef material. At least two writers have attacked the young age position using the argument that this coral atoll must have taken a very long time to form. Thick atolls, such as any Wetok, require the ocean floor to sink as the coral builds. As the coral is lowered, faster growth is possible than that which we measure at the surface. Such reef growth rates have been reported as high as 414 millimetres per year in the Celebes. At such a rate, the entire thickness of the Eniwetok Atoll could have been formed in less than three and a half thousand years. This 414 millimetres growth per year is referencing a 1932 publication. If this is quoted to you by a creationist, I can practically guarantee you three things. They have cut and pasted the quote. They have never read the publication in question. They have never done any research into coral growth rates. If they had done any research, they would not bother quoting some obscure 80-year-old publication and instead perhaps quote from Marine Biodiversity Records, Volume 2 from 2009, which discusses the possibility of using whip black corals to regenerate the reefs in the Celebes because they can grow at a rate of up to 1,590 millimetres per year. Now, individual maximum growth rates are not everything and what happens in Indonesia tells us little about what happens in any Wetak. But let us stick to their obscurely referenced off-cut-and-pasted 414 millimetres per year. Of course, Ken Ham doesn't believe in historical science. That's what we would call uh, historical science. It's, it's beliefs about the past when you weren't there. You weren't even there, man! So how these historical science claims about what happened in the past slipped through Ken's editorial gaze, I just don't know. 
To sustain this argument, the platform would have had to drop uniformly by 414 millimetres, that's 16 inches, every single year for three and a half thousand years. Any faster and the coral would drown, any slower and it would die in the air. This becomes a bigger problem when you know that Alvaro de Saavedra arrived on the atoll in 1529, so that we know that the island has not sunk 650 feet in the past 484 years, or for the uncountable generations which passed for the local natives before they were troubled by foreigners. As they ponder that question, remind them that Ken Ham and his trained monkeys readily admit to an ice age after the flood. Millions of mammoth tusks leave them no choice. They explain it away as a 700-year event. So how do they now explain the continual uniform subsidence of any Weetak occurring whilst the oceans around the world were receding dramatically as Ken's 700-year ice age sucked the water out of the oceans into massive glaciers? If we take just a few generations living on the islands before before Savidra found them, Ken now has a 1,500-year hole in his plan for reef growth on any Weetak. His next effort is by John Whitmore. Whitmore quotes Roth again to cope with fast coral deposition, but he adds a bit. The Eniwetak Atoll is not made completely of corals that have grown on top of each other. Drilling operations into the atoll have shown that a significant amount of the material, up to 70% of the borehole, was soft, fine, white, chalky limestone. This is a lie, to which I shall return. Whitmore then goes on to explain, Here is a possible scenario of how the Eniwetak Atoll may have become so thick in the few thousand years since the flood. The reef began as a volcanic platform. Carbonates, limestones, began to accumulate on the platform as the result of bacteria and other organisms that can precipitate calcite, especially in volcanically warmed water. So he's completely contradicting the previous post. The atoll has no longer been sinking at the rate of 16 inches a year, but instead, for three and a half thousand years, bacteria has been crapping muddy limestone on top of an old volcano a mile under the Pacific. And of course, it never got washed away by ocean currents or storms. I'll come back to this as well. The last paper that I could find on AIG is titled Massive Modern Reefs Finding Time to Grow by Whitmore again in 2012. And with reference to any Weetak, he states... The drilling did not find corals, but large caverns and chalky limestone, mud, deep under the island. Corals did not become common until very late in the island's history. And? So the drillers found that most of the island was not built of corals at all, but of hard limestone mud. And this is the problem when trying to explain what we know by observations has happened in the past in terms of a 2,000-year-old musty book of myths. Eventually, every creationist has to lie, and once they've brought that ticket, they are prepared to say anything. Ham's hypocrisy screams out every time he tries to use historical science to refute real science. So let's talk about reality. Any Weetak is another of those picturesque paradise spots which was inhabited for a few thousand years before Europeans found it and decided no one owned it. The geology. As we have seen, as early as 1842, Charles Darwin had published his hypothesis on coral atolls and stated, there are many large tracts of ocean without any high land interspersed with reefs and islets, formed by the growth of those kind of corals which cannot live at great depths. And the existence of these reefs and low islets in such numbers and such distant points is quite inexplicable, excepting on the theory that the bases on which the reefs first became attached slowly and successively sank beneath the level of the sea whilst the corals continued to grow upwards. Alexander Agassiz rejected Darwin's idea for the reason that Darwin's hypothesis of gradual subsidence flew in the face of evidence of uplift which Agassiz had seen. Now, there was a little history between Darwin and Agassiz, the giant of glaciology, geology, paleontology and natural history that was Louis Agassiz, Alexander's father, never accepted Darwin's theory of evolution. Louis was a student of Cuvier and Humboldt, both giants themselves. Georges Cuvier, possibly the father of comparative anatomy and paleontology, was a proponent of catastrophism. He did not accept evolution. He believed the Earth to be millions of years old and based his catastrophic ideas on the fossil record available to him. He saw no evidence of forms transitioning and held to a view that repeated catastrophes resulted in the sudden appearance and then disappearance of fossil forms. 
Louis Agassiz was a staunch creationist and a racist, neither viewpoints unusual in his time. Ironically, it was his work on glaciers which revolutionised geology and confined the biblical flood to mythology, but he refused to accept evolution, and writing in the Atlantic Monthly in July 1864, Agassiz described the glaciers which had scraped across Europe and North America as God's great plough, an act of purpose along catastrophism lines with which God swept out the old and prepared the land for his final masterpiece, Humans. In 1857, Agassiz published his first two volumes of contribution to the natural history of the United States. The first volume comprises mainly Agassiz's essay on classification. Agassiz considered his essay to be a tour de force, answering all the questions and explaining how God had recreated the planet many times and created life many times, as shown by the fossil strata he'd seen. The essay on classification was published in England in 1859. A few months later, Darwin published On the Origin of Species. Alexander Agassiz, Agassiz Jr., corresponded with many scientists regarding atolls, including Huxley Darwin, John Murray, and Edgeworth David. Edgeworth David was part of an 1897 boring expedition to Funafuti. This expedition had as its prime mission to bore a hole to at least 600 feet to see if Darwin's hypothesis held water. The team reached a depth of 1,114 feet and confirmed that the lowest core of the boring is composed of consolidated, dolomitized coral reef sand. It is made up of various small organisms or fragments of organisms which are bound together by well-marked fibrous encrusting material, which more than usually resembles that occurring near the top of the boring. It was coral all the way down. So within 60 years, science had proved Darwin's theory correct, but Agassiz Jr. was yet to be impressed. I mentioned that Agassiz was also in communication with John Murray. Murray was part of the three-and-a-half-year Challenger expedition to survey the world's oceans between 1872 and 1876. He is credited with discovering the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and ocean trenches. Murray was working on oceanic sediments and suggested to Agassiz that pelagic sediments could raise ocean platforms to the level where reef activity could take over. My naive view is that it would take something very special to create a mile-high pile of pelagic sediment against these ocean currents. Agassiz Jr. was never convinced by Darwin's hypothesis, despite Edgeworth David's report. He also questions the technique employed at Funafuti, suggesting that the boring should be done in a region where volcanic beds are underlying the coral reefs. Now, they were at Funafuti. Magnetic soundings had evidenced a volcanic bed underlying the reef, but in the event, the boring was done at the opposite side of the lagoon from the strongest magnetic disturbance, and this gave Agassiz Jr. enough reason to maintain his position. It would be nearly 60 years before work of a similar calibre would be carried out again. During the US nuclear test programme, extensive scientific and geological studies were carried out on any WETAC. Many shallow boreholes and three deep boreholes were drilled on the atoll in 1951 and 1952. Two of these boreholes penetrated through the entire limestone cap to reach the basalt base of the atoll. In 1947, a 2,556-foot deep hole was bored at Bikini Atoll. All of the detailed geophysical reports are available online. Any WETAC is coral all the way to the bedrock. The 4,600 feet of limestone upon which any WETAC sits is a result of gradual subsidence of the basalt platform over geological time. At times, elevation above sea level has occurred, resulting in coral die-off, and the periods when this has occurred can be matched with identical periods for Bikini Atoll. Odd that three creation scientists researching and presenting evidence on coral atoll formations had managed to miss this freely available information on the subject. Thanks for watching. Thank you.